Hey, Bob. How you doing? More? Nothing. Okay. Ready, go? Okay.
Welcome, everybody. It's good to be together here again for this um, number five of five formation series conversations. We've had a good time, and I think some really meaningful uh, conversations and input from from lots of people in our in our community and including from our congregation. So thanks for being a part of that. Tonight we have three speakers. Two of them are are here. But I thought, well, we can start with the two people that we have. And our conversation will continue uh, to unfold as it does. Um, I want to remind us that we've got cards, signs that have been created for us. Um, this came out of our first conversation when we were talking about um, disability accessibility and talking about some of the things we do around here and have access to. And one thing that was mentioned was some way to remind those of us who are speaking here or holding a microphone um, that there are times when I think you can hear me, uh, but maybe you can't. Or I may think I'm doing a great job speaking, but I maybe could, could do better. So. Um, tonight we're, we're talking about how, as a congregation, um, we can be aware of people who, who perhaps experience poverty, um, would be one way of putting it, or simply people who have experiences of finances, resources, employment, education, access to resources in the community that are different from what we experience. Um, as mostly uh, middle class, white uh, people in this community. Um, so uh, Kay Bontrager Singer is here, who is a pastor at Faith Mennonite Church. We were partners for a long, long time in that business. So I'm so happy that she is here because I know um, that she has um, a lot of experience in the community, uh, particularly being in relationship with people. Uh, over a long period of time, and um, both in her personal life and also in the congregation, helping to to uh, be a place that is spiritual community and uh, a place of friendship and worship uh, for people who experience all these things differently um, and knows something about the barriers that can be uh, a part of our church life. Um, Rod Hollinger Jansen, our own, um, is also uh, willing to share with us tonight, and we're grateful for that. Um, Rod's been connected, many of you know, to the Poor People's Campaign, the chapter here, and is it is it called Elkhart County chapter, or is it sort of Elkhart, Goshen, South Bend, roughly uh, um, people connecting to the Poor People's Campaign, and so... Uh, Sunitha Mills Saps uh, has been invited and we've been in conversation. I believe she's coming and will be here. So when she comes, she'll get on board too. Um, Sunitha has broad experience. She uh, has most recently been a pastor at Prairie Street um, and is moving into a position at Goshen College uh, now, which um, I can't say her title, but I'll let her describe that maybe when she comes. Um, so I'll let each of these folks um, share from their experience uh, individually and then we'll invite them to kind of sit here and uh, be open to answer some, some questions that we all might have. So, Kay, I'll let you begin. Thanks for being here. I have no problem with speaking loud, but I do have a problem with speaking slowly, so that's what I will focus on here. Uh, just a little bit of introduction before I tell you a story. So our family began attending at Faith Mennonite about 27 years ago. It was a fairly new congregation at that point, and it had been an intentional congregation that started out of a small group with the emphasis of being church for folks who didn't feel comfortable coming into a middle-class educated congregation, particularly that was the assembly congregation. And um, so that work had started when, when we began to attend. Um, the, the persons that I would say are sort of 
our people tend to be Caucasian, English speaking. There's a lot of good things happening in these communities around immigrants and uh, Spanish speakers, but that has not been where our, our primary focus has been. Several things that have shaped this, our congregation is we have a meal together every Sunday night. So we consider that part of our worship as we move from, from our worship space to um, a meal and one, two weeks a month it's potluck and once it's crock pot and once it's uh, soup and bread. So we know that schedule, it takes everybody to, we're close to mm, 85 people on a Sunday night usually. So it takes everybody just jumping in and helping bring food, clean up, and that also is a form of uh, establishing community when we do those kind of things together. It's sort of like in your kitchen, you know, when you have guests over and you hang out and talk in your kitchen. It serves that purpose. We also have two hospitality houses that sort of, because we share a building with assembly, um, and it used to be the day, Walnut Hill daycare was there yet, it was heavily used, and we sort of needed some of our own space, and we decided, who are we? It made the most sense to um, get a house, because that fit more with our model of who we, who we are. And we also had people in the congregation who were in and out of, of homelessness and needing housing, and so we were acutely aware of that need. So, oh, was it 17 years ago? We, we 2005, we purchased the Faith House, and about five years ago, we purchased the Hope House, which is next to it, and have continued to have those as places uh, for short-term emergency housing. It isn't necessarily that those folks always come to worship at faith. They may or may not. Uh, they often go to um, open table, which meets uh, in the faith house on Sunday mornings, which Carla is now the pastor doula for. Uh, but over time, some of these folks continue to come back and return. And so right now, we've got quite a few uh, previous guests that are part of faith. In the last um, few, oh, the last six months or so, we sort of had influx of quite a few newer people. When I talk about poverty, I'm talking about generational poverty. There's situational poverty, which is, you know, you have terrible medical bills, lose jobs, whatever. But you maybe have family who has resources or you have an education. Um, you know how to function in a middle class world, even if you're short on money. Uh, I'm talking about generational poverty, where you're looking at two, three, four generations plus who have all lived in poverty and don't have those resources to other people who have maybe more income as none of their family members or friends um, have education or, or much resources. That's a kind of poverty that I am, I am uh, reflecting on and what is where we focus our attention. So, um, like I said, recently there's been, well, particularly I was thinking about women, about six, seven, eight, maybe ten, women who are fairly new to the congregation, who I thought, oh, how can we draw them in in something beyond Sunday nights and such? And so it was getting towards Valentine's, and I now have two female co-pastors with me, so we like to plan parties. And we planned a Galentine's party with a specific focus of making sure these women felt welcome. So the invitation went out in our newsletter, everybody's invited, but knowing that these women aren't gonna show up because there's, in, there's an open invitation in a newsletter. It needs a very specific invitation and we want you there and this is what to expect and this is how we navigate it. So I also, so this went out the whole congregation but I sent an email to about six or seven women in the congregation who I know have some connections and would be the kind of people who would call, text, invite. And I said, these are the women that I particularly want to make sure that we invite. And it's okay if they get invited more than once. Um, actually, I found out some of them that got invited three or four times, they were so thrilled. It's like, we are really wanted. It's like, yes, you are. Um, but then it's a little different than just plan an event. You, you need to be thinking about things and it takes a lot between announcing this and, and the actual event. So things that take, you have taken into consideration, transportation. So you say, we'll give transportation to whoever needs transportation. Um, there's persons that have physical disabilities and 
were concerned about how far they had to park. And so I made sure there was parking right in front of the house. Um, concerned about getting up the steps, so we made sure we'd have somebody there to help up the steps. We had food, we let them know that we're not gonna be doing any kind of games or competitive things that they would feel uncomfortable with. It was gonna be pretty low key. I pretty much told them what the evening would look like, which was eating chocolate and food and getting to know each other in, in smaller groups. Making sure there were chairs that were comfortable that for large women that they didn't feel like they were gonna break a chair. I mean, that's a big deal. Um, so those were some of the things that were put in place and reassured. And, and that week before, I had many text messages the day of. One person probably texted me four times, again with questions, needing reassurance. And I said, yep, I got these things in place. But it, but it takes a lot more to pull that together. And, and it was a great time. We had great fun. We had a good turnout. And um, they want to do something again. So now we're going to have a uh, Easter Monday, which is right after Easter Monday. And we're going to make spring hats, bonnets, like bring old silk flowers and ribbons and we'll, with glue gun, we'll make ourselves fancy hats for, for the fun of it. So that's the next, but again, uh, I'm just now inviting that group because we don't really want to overflow it with sort of middle class uh, women who are coming and going. These women now are beginning to feel comfortable and safe in this context. So we want to keep it familiar with familiar people. So if you got, if you came the first time, anybody was invited, now you get an invitation to the second one. Uh, so that's just one example of, of what goes into planning an event sometimes that you have to think about in, in some different ways. Um, A couple questions for you. Have you ever shared a meal in your home um, or been shared a meal in a home of another economic class or culture? Uh, have you made mistakes or been embarrassed in doing that? Are there ways you could have been better prepared? Um, are you uncomfortable when you don't know what to expect from others? There's all kinds of hidden rules about behavior and how to act and how things work that upper class have, middle class have, lower class have. And we assume that everybody knows sort of the rules that we function. We don't even think about them the rules. It's just, this is how we do things, right? But I mean, if you were invited, invited to the, at least if I was invited to the White House for some special dinner, I'd be nervous and I'd have to go on Google and do some etiquette, you know, checking and making sure I don't do anything like use the wrong fork the wrong time or, um, we would, we, would, we would feel that class difference. The same is true for folks who have uh, lived in, in poverty. It, it is a class difference. I always remember, well, anyway, let me say this. Excellent book, I'd encourage it for a, uh, anybody to read, but it's also a good book for small groups, Sunday school classes. What every church member should know about poverty. Very, very helpful. It was very helpful to me early on. For example, I remember one night, um, Jamie called to invite a family for dinner that had been coming for a little while, and we knew him from church, but hadn't had him in our home yet. And um, I broke a rule that you're supposed to never do, like you're not to talk to your spouse when they're on the phone call. You're not to be going, say this, say that, you know. But I did that because I realized that the invitation for dinner was being declined. And I said, tell him we'll have pizza on the front porch. So he said, we'll have pizza on the front porch. And just like that, they were ready to come. Uh, because they were uncomfortable coming into our home, how formal this meal would be to sit down and what, what they may or may not know and may be embarrassed. Um, so we had pizza on the front porch. In time, we did several uh, football seasons of having pizza on the front porch with his family every Friday night before a home football game. And then we'd all walk down to a football game when our oldest son was playing. And, and so it was a fun kind of um, ongoing, ongoing kind of, I mean, the relationship continued. 
uh, but learned how to make that more of a, a welcoming environment for them. I'm just gonna make you guys sit up and stand, stand and sit for a little bit here because I am going to go over some questions to see where you think you fall between poverty, middle class, or upper class. Okay, here we go. If these fit you, stand up. If not, stay sitting. So just pop up and down. I'm not gonna take very long on these. And Okay, they're nothing, they don't even bear us by any of these. Um, I know what churches to go to in order to get help in Goshen. Okay. I know which groceries, okay, sit down. I know what grocery store garbage bins can uh, I can get access for throw it away food. <laughs> College students are good at knowing that. <laughs> yeah. I know how to get somebody out of jail. I know how to physically fight and defend myself physically. Boy, you got this down. I know how to live without a checking account. Live without a checking account. Just work off a of cash. Okay. I know how to live without electricity or a phone. Okay. Some of you who've been out, lived out of the country, you got that one down. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I know what to do when I don't have money to pay bills. I know how to use uh, food stamps, SNAP. Okay. I can get a lot by without a car. That can be for various reasons. People think that. Okay. Here's some middle. Here's some questions. Um, I know how to get my kid into little league, piano lessons, soccer. Okay. Sit down. I know how to set a table properly, you know, with a knife and fork and spoon go. Okay. I know which stores carry the brands uh, of clothes that my children or my family tends to wear. I know how to order at a nice restaurant. I know how to use a credit card, checking account, savings account. I understand medical insurance, disability insurance, life insurance, at least to some, some ability. <laughs> I talk to my children about going to college. I know how to help my children with their homework and do not hesitate to call the school if I need additional information or assistance. I repair in my ha items in my house almost immediately when they break or know a repair service that I can call. Okay. So there you go. You look like a pretty middle class bunch of folks just like me. Now try these out. I can read a menu in French, English, or uh, other languages, like multiple languages. Ah, okay. Try this one. I have several favorite restaurants in different countries around the world. <laughs> Guys. I bet this one you don't do. During the holidays, I know how to hire a decorator to identify the appropriate themes and items which I need for decorating my house. Okay. You just have, yeah. You got somebody at the church you can call, right? I know. I'm that person for faith. I have at least two residents that are staffed and maintained. <laughs> I find my own plane or the company plane. 
Oh, you guys, I tell you. Um, I support or buy work of a particular artist. Hey, okay. <laughs> okay, so there you can see that there's things we don't know as a middle class how to do to do either. Um, some of the different values, let me just uh, review a few values. And I'm just going to stick between poverty and middle class uh, for time's sake. Um, I know how to use money to be used and spent. Middle class tend to often think about we know how to manage money. Uh, we have money, money to manage, not just uh, the bills come and immediately figure out which ones can be paid and which ones can't. Um, the world view, if you are a person in poverty, usually is pretty small, like Goshen or Indiana, Kentucky. Um, so I'm conscious when we do things with for MCC or other things that we're, we do, if we spend a lot of time talking about um, what's happening in their countries or the needs in other countries, just think if you are sitting there, like right now there's two households that are in danger of losing their housing, like on the edge of being homeless. So how does it feel when we're talking about giving money and helping somebody out in Ethiopia when I'm sitting here and I'm on the very verge of homelessness. Now, it's good to, think, to have these international perspectives, obviously. But again, you, you, you try to get in your head what that looks like from another perspective. Um, another one is our church budget that we do differently. And our church budget is all internal, which, you know, sounds terrible. Like, you know, you, you take not pride, but you take satisfaction in your budget having these external things that you give to, MCC and all these sort of things. Again, when, when like our, our budget now is up to 100,000 for faith, which is really a big deal. But when you are living on 15, 20,000 match uh, income, that seems like a huge amount. And then you add all these extra good things to give to, it, it's like, it's a disconnect. Uh, it's like they're sort of out, of out of the framework of understanding. So um, people give to outside organizations on their own. It doesn't come through the church budget except like conference, a couple things like that. But most of our other giving like to MCC, Mission Board, uh, special causes, um, people do individually. So um, let's see here if there's a couple things. So what does it mean for us to walk with people in poverty? One of the, one of the you could say it's an asset or a deficit. We don't have a very big emergency fund or money to help out people. So the good part of that is you got to find ways that it's not just about helping out financially. And the, the trick when you get into financial helping out is you begin to have this significant power differential. And you got to pay attention to that, uh, the haves and the have-nots. And, and that doesn't feel good if you're always on the receiving side and somebody holds the power of whether you have money or not. Sometimes people come to faith and they know exactly what somebody needs. I remember someone said, if this person only had a vehicle, they could get a job. Makes sense, right? So got this person a vehicle. They didn't get a job because there were all kinds of other factors. So what we thought was needed to help them along wasn't what they needed or wanted. Um, and that uh, we did the same with helping someone buy a house and we were selling it to them. Um, that turned out a disaster because they really weren't interested in buying a house nor have the money for upkeep. And so you, you learn to figure out how do we be, how are we community together? And I would say the big word is friendship. We walk together. People aren't necessarily going, we're not going to pop them out of poverty. Uh, and not even, not, people of course want enough food and a bed. But a lot of folks aren't necessarily looking to 
have a Cush bank account um, or move into some really big, nice house. It, it, those are middle class values that we aspire to. So it's, it's learning to know what, what the need is that we can offer as support, uh, encouragement, and really friendship. And then we, we are a, we, we have a, we're our power source in the sense that we have connections. So um, sometimes we can advocate to a judge or uh, some other organization. Um, just, yeah, we're, we're people who have more connections to help them make connections, and that can be really helpful. And then there's the long, long history and trust that builds over years and years of friendship. And those are rich. Um, they're sometimes hard, um, but they're also rich. And personally, what it does is it makes me quite satisfied with my life, um, seeing people who are functioning and enjoying life with a lot less than I do always just helps me bring some perspective uh, for myself and I think for our congregation it for sure did for our kids. Our kids never felt poor or like they were really deprived of anything because so many of the people that they knew and friends had so much less um, and that, that helps form us as individuals as well. So you can ask questions a little bit. I'm going to call this it for now. Thanks, Kay. That was that was a wonderful, uh, wonderful perspective. Um, well, I I did something quite different than, um, and I, I'm not sure whether this fits or not, but it's what I got, so that's what you're going to get. Uh, but I I actually took a step back from um, you know the relationships and the continuity and and the. Uh, the building of trust and all of that that Kay was talking about in these in these uh, relationships that that faith has, and I was asking myself, okay, well, what kind of what 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 kind of commitments do we need to have as a congregation or even as individuals um, in order to engage really with with anyone who's who's different than we are. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, and I'm, I'm going to draw on, on some of the experiences that I've had in the past to, uh, to, to get to that place. Um, so one of the things is that um, I grew up in northern Saskatchewan in uh, a rural Mennonite church, uh, and... Uh, it was, it was rich, it was good in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, I learned about faith, I learned about family, I learned about um, community. Uh, and the other thing was that this community, like, like, like so many, uh, was, was kind of bathed in, in an ethos of white supremacy. So we were uh, farmers and we were farming land uh, that had been occupied by uh, Plains Cree people for centuries. And uh, in 1885, there had been a rebellion of First Nations and, and, and Métis people uh, literally 20 miles away from where I grew up. And that rebellion was put down by uh, Canadian troops. And right after that happened, the Mennonites started moving into the area. So there's, there's just this direct connection between this colonial settler uh, thing and, uh, and my life. Uh, and then uh, something that added to that for me was that when I was in third grade, um, a kind of an integration happened where uh, First Nations kids that had been... Uh, going to their own separate school, started coming to school in, in uh, Rostron Elementary School. And uh, no preparation. <laughs> Nobody said a word about this. And you know, no, no one thought about what it meant to bring two different groups together, two different cultures together. 
It just happened. And, you know, with predictable results. I mean, there were, you know, like you go on the playground and there's this group of First Nations kids over here and there's this group of white kids over there. And, um, you know, at, at some points I, I tried a little bit to engage in, in, in some kind of dialogue. I mean, as a, you know, nine, 10 year old kid. Uh, well, but, um, you know, it was, these were two separate worlds. And then at church, I remember a couple of years later, uh, there was a sermon, you know, talking about how God loves everybody. And uh, after the sermon, there was always a time when, you know, anybody who wanted to respond to the sermon could stand up. So I stood up and I asked, well, if that's the case, why aren't there any Cree First Nations people in our church? And, um, you know, nobody answered the question. And for me, that question is, is, still, is still there. Uh, it's still there. Um, so after college then, um, I went to Burkina Faso with MCC. And uh, one of the things that really struck me there is uh, the, the living faith of people. I, I mean, I, I was brought up in a Christian environment, but um, I, was, I was amazed at the level of faith that kids my age uh, had and uh, was really challenged uh, in, 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 in a good way to, to increase my own faith because of what I was experiencing there in the church. Um, and so I think Kay alluded to this too, right? Like there's, it's not a one-way street, these relationships. I mean, there, there's, there's richness on both sides that, that, that um, we, we benefit from greatly when we, when we cross the bridge and, and uh, start, start relating to others. Um, so this, this kind of um, uh, went on uh, when Linda and I went to Benin. Um, and I would say, two things that stand out from, from the first period of our time in Benin was, first of all, always have a learning stance. Uh, and secondly, hospitality is so important. And, you know, it's just right what, what Kay was telling us too. And um, so um, there I was, you know, Greenhorn, um, supposedly uh, needing to organize Bible courses and there was a committee uh, that was set up, committee of, of the Council of Churches where we were. And so this committee was supposed to meet and help us to get to the place where we organized Bible courses. So I sent out written invitations to all the committee members and you know, said, you know, uh, we're meeting at this time and this place and so forth. And so I get to the meeting place and sit there. No one else is there. After an hour, uh, one person shows up, and the first question he asked was, well, did you pray before you sent out the invitations? Hmm. That was a good question. Uh, and then the second thing uh, that, he, that he told me was, you know, here's, here's what we're going to do. You're going to invite every member of the committee to your home for a meal, and then after that has done, then we're going to call for a meeting again, and we'll see what happens. So, uh, you know, Linda and I prepared for this. So it has to be the head of the committee first. So we invited the head of, head of the committee, and, uh, you know, 6 o'clock on this certain day. Well, 6 o'clock, meal was ready. Uh, by about eight o'clock, Linda and I were really hungry, so we just sat down and ate. Uh, 10 o'clock, uh, no one was there. Uh, we were just about ready to pack it in. 10.30, uh, he showed up with his wife, sat down. We had a nice conversation while they ate. Um, and, you know, that was it. And then we did that for the other committee members. And after that process of hospitality, Establishing relationship, I sent around another invitation. This time, people showed up. 
So, you know, it's just this, you know, the basics, right? And then um, another thing is willing to be wrong. So, um, you know, I was supposed to work with this council of churches, uh, try to figure out how to teach scripture in a way that people could hear. And, of course, there were, you know, as many different perspectives on things as there were churches. Um, so at one point, I was talking about baptism, and I said, well, you know, I think that uh, uh, the, the meaning of baptism is much more important than the mode of baptism. At our next committee meeting, uh, a member came to me and said, um, you know what, you really need to learn about baptism. And uh, what you taught just simply is not true. And so uh, we organized a day where there was going to be teaching about baptism. But this time I was, I was the student. And uh, the man who had confronted me uh, was the teacher. And we spent six hours talking about baptism. Um, and uh, after that, then it was okay and, and, and we, could, we could move on. But I think, um, you know, just... Being willing to be wrong, right? Being willing to be corrected if you need to be corrected um, is also part of the process because we don't know. We make mistakes. We, we don't know uh, how, to, how to negotiate these, these spaces, these situations. Um, and another thing, uh, again, is, is uh, sharing power. So when uh, a few years later, when the, um, this committee that eventually led to the formation of BBI uh, was, was getting going, um, we sat down at the first meeting and uh, Augustin Ahoga, I think some of you might remember him. Uh, so he had a question for those of us representing the mission. He said, um, you know, do you agree to train uh, Beninese people both for teaching and for the administration of the school? Do you agree with that? And we had received um, a note from, from the board, uh, Mennonite Board of Missions at the time, from the board, uh, when they had heard about the fact that the school was going to start, they said, this has got to be run locally. And I mean, we were happy with that. We were agreed with that. And uh, so we said to Augustin, we said, yes, we are agreed that we will help to train people who will step into leadership at the school. And he said, if you're agreed, then we can move on. If you're not agreed, take your school and go somewhere else. Uh, you know, and, and, and so it was so clear that um, if you're not willing to share power, you know, we don't have a relationship. Um, if you are willing to share power, then we can, t then we can go somewhere together. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I think, you know, my work with the Poor People's Campaign is, is really just a, a continuation of, of this. It's, it's the same work. Um, it, it's simply, it's, it's listening to people who are in situations of poverty and trying to understand, not, not making solutions for people, trying to understand what, what people identify as their own needs and then working with that as, as, as we can. But I wanted to, uh, I want just to raise one, um, to give one example of how maybe a church could, could work at these kinds of things. And, I think, I mean, the absolute key, you know, and it's what, is what Kay and, and Faith are doing, is put yourself in spaces where you actually meet people who are different than you. I mean, th there's, there's nothing that substitutes for that. that that's the key. Uh, if you're willing to put yourself in those spaces, relationships can develop. And when relationships develop, things happen. Um, so I, I just want to, some of you probably know this example already, but I want to talk about Shalom Mennonite Church in Tucson, where, you know, Tina Schleba is, is pastoring along with some others uh, on the team there. 
So this, this church used to be a largely white congregation, but they started getting involved in, in immigration issues. And of course, it's a border state, and so they, they were uh, connecting uh, with undocumented people, other people uh, in, in, in that situation. And when you, when you get involved with the community, you build relationships. And when you build relationships with the community, some people ended up saying, you know, I'd like to be a part of your church. And so little by little, there was a, a, a group of um, Latinx people who were, who were uh, joining the church. Then about five or six years ago, um, Tina got a call from, from a Congolese man. They, th this family had just arrived in Tucson, and they... He had Mennonite connections, and he wanted, he wanted to know where the Mennonite church was. And somehow or other, he figured out that if he contacted Tina, he, you know, he'd, he'd get some answers. Well, of course, he, he just arrived, didn't speak much English and all, and all of that. And so Tina knew that at that point I was working with Congolese folks, and so she, she wrote and said, hey, you know, can you help me out here? So we organized a phone call, and um, again, it was like, um, you're welcome. You know, please, please come to church. We want you in church. We, 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 we want you to be with us. Um, and, you know, is there something that we can do to, you know, you've just arrived here. Is there something that we can do to make your life a little easier? Like what, what can the church, how can the church be of help to you? And, you know, she kept that up for, for a long time. And now th this family is one of the pillars of, of Shalom Mennonite Church. And not only that, but this family has, has, has brought in a number of other Congolese families, because that's, you know, that's how this works, right? Uh, and so now this church, it used to be basically white, is one-third uh, Latinx, one-third Congolese, and one-third white. And... Are there problems? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you know, they all have their own foods that they like. You know, they they they, they all have their own worship styles that they like. They all, ha you know, like it's it's a it's a it's a it's a difficult situation. And then you know, if you don't pray right, uh, you got a problem. So like you know, Tina was visiting somebody in the hospital once. One of the one of the Congolese families and. And uh, she didn't, you know, she didn't pray hard enough for healing, and, and, and she got blasted, you know, like, who are you? Are you really a pastor? Like, you know, and, and so, and so she, you know, she's had, to, she's had to stand in the middle where, <laughs> you know, she probably wasn't understood by, by other people in her congregation, and she's not understood by, by the people she's reaching out to, and, it, and it's, a, it's a difficult spot to be in, and, and yet... There's a community that's forming, and the you know the community's still there, and it survived some of these difficult places, and um, and it's it's amazing, um, you know, not saying even that that's the only way to to do things, but but it takes you know both deliberate action of getting people into the space where they can actually make relationships and seizing the opportunities that come, that come your way, like she did when, when the Congolese family called. Um, and things happen when, when, uh, when, those, when those things uh, are respected. So anyway, so that's what I had to share this evening. Thank you both very much for your sharing. And um, I'll invite you to come up so we can, we can ask you some questions. If, you, uh, if you'd like to use the, the lectern, you can, but I thought if you, were, if you were up front here, you wouldn't have to jump up and down to a different space. Does anyone have a... Starting off question. Um, 
You know, I get the idea of sharing the power. I'm wondering, though, how do you have a mantra or something? Because I think my tendency is to want to fix things and to stop and listen to what's. So, how do you crank your head to do that? Does that make, does that make any sense? Because you talked about this is a person that needed a car, you thought, got a car, didn't work. Um, um, so how do you keep moving on? That's too many questions, but. Yeah, I think practice. And with each relationship, you practice that, and they teach you also how to do that. And yeah, it's just, it's not about your agenda. <laughs> And people have left faith because they get so frustrated because they have all these good ideas for somebody or people and they just don't do it the way they think it should be done. And so. Okay, maybe I could, uh, your last comment about people leaving faith because of the way it could, it probably connects to my broader question at that point. At least from uh, a number of my acquaintances that I believe do or have been part of faith, uh, they're not all people in poverty, point, but you know, there's a certain uh, point of connection. Um, do you see yourself as at times a bridge between that realm of people that face and experience as their lives of poverty and those in the congregation that are middle class, well, I assume middle class at point, would you name yourself of a bridge or all the people that stick it out as middle class finally get it and they're just like K? People in time get it. So for okay. example, yeah. if we have like 13, 11 people who are wanting to covenant. We don't do membership. We do covenant every year. That I want you to covenant this year with faith. And most of those people are persons that would be sort of marginal people. And um, we set them up with, and Darren and I did this together for many years, we set them up with a faith friend. So it's not, I'm not as a pastor, I'm not the one that's doing all the meeting with them, telling about their current gate, you know, telling, us, telling them about faith and but we have a, a setup where you connect with somebody and you, you share your faith stories, your church experiences, why you'd want to be at faith in exchange. Um, and then when they covenant for the first time, that person, the, the person who's been in the congregation, introduces and talks about this person. But you've, you've put together a pair intentionally that is outside of pastors. Um, it, it really... You can't, I mean, it, this, this needs far more people than pastors. And some people are better than others. But most people, if they're at faith, for, they sort of grow into this understanding every time. They may come because they like the music, but in time, they get it, uh, usually. So could I ask kind of a question on the other kind of side of that kind of spectrum? You had mentioned that you've had a number of persons or families that have come from that and maybe currently in poverty, but have, in a sense, established themselves. I, is, am I speaking correctly? It's not just transient folks. That, no, no, right? no. So I think I'm... At right, some point, years. I mean, right, part right. of the congregation for many years. Do, do they play a role, whether appropriate, to be a bridge the other way? Absolutely. Okay. They are wonderful, and they are the best people to bring in their friends and family. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't, yeah, couldn't do it without them. So would a number of those seven individuals you talked about, would those have likely been the connections? A bridge, it wasn't Kay and all her great... Exactly. Nuclear. I would yes. presume that. And so that seems to be a very important component, that seed, but then it needs to kind of grow in itself and connect them. Thank you. Um, the question I was going to ask was sort of what Bill just asked, but did it start as, you know, middle class people saying we are going to move into this space where we can encounter people living in poverty? I mean, was the core group, um, I don't know, uh, sort of um, 
I don't know, a, a daughter congregation of assembly saying we we're going to live this out in a different way? So how it sort of began is that folks in their jobs or other ways were making connections and inviting people to church, people to come to church and say, you know, this place is really educated. I don't like I quite know how to act and be here. And so a group of those people got themselves together and said, how, how can we give an option for worship and church that... Um, makes them feel welcome. And so there was already connections made. The first pastor um, went to AMBS for some classes, but also was a factory worker. And he brought significant people, amount of people uh, to the congregation to start with. And some of that changed over during time. But over time, um, yeah, just significant amount of solid people. How would you say that affects the, the theology of the church of faith? Um, not that Jesus was a middle-class American and so everyone should try to be like that. But it's, it's, it's hard to divorce the economic message of the gospel from the rest of the gospel. Uh, and I just wonder how that plays out. Like when when we hear of Jesus say, give all your money away and follow me, that probably sounds different to us than it might be in your congregation. Um, and I'd just be interested in, in how that dynamic changes. I'm sure it would be different if, if I was a billionaire and owned a multinational company. I would hear that different than as a person who develops housing. Um, I'm not quite sure what to say to that, except I'm always humbled by the generosity of those who have a little. Uh, they have a little, and they're and they're sharing it. And you know, when the, it's sort of like the woman with the the small amount, you know, gave her last. You know, people bring up their offerings, and their two dollars, their change, their five dollars is as much as significantly more than what what I would have. I mean percentage probably more than what I give. And so, um, yeah, I'm not sure that gets at quite what you're asking, but we learn a lot from those with less. Rod, would you want to speak to that as far as moving Absolutely. <laughs> Your social location has a great effect on how you read scripture, on how you understand the gospel. There's, there's absolutely no question in my mind that that's the case. Um, and, and that's part of the richness of, you know, doing this boundary crossing that Jesus calls us to, right, is that in doing that, we discover a lot more about this message that we're carrying uh, that we didn't even know, um, and and so um, yeah, there's to me there's there's no downside. I mean, the thing the thing is that it's it's hard work, and and we need to also be prepared to give up things that maybe seem important to us in order for this to happen, and and that's the challenge, uh, because it doesn't just happen. You you have to create a space, like like Kay was saying, you have to create a space where people feel comfortable. And what does that mean? Well, it means, you know, changing the way you do a lot of stuff. And, and, and so, yeah, I don't know. Again, it's not, that's not the only way to work at, at things. I mean, you know, you can, you, can, you can also be sent out into the community as a, as a church or as individuals to, to do this kind of work as well. It, it doesn't have to all happen in church, but there is a real richness and a challenge when it happens in church. I wonder, Kay, uh, one thing you might be able to speak to, I'm thinking about theology and, and inclusion and just sort of the idea of radical acceptance. I mean, we're, we're in a, does it, does it buzz less if I hold it close to my mouth or farther away? Closer, yeah, okay. Um, 
we're in a series on inclusion. The congregation has made a statement, you know, that we want to be welcoming, you know, specifically LGBTQ folks, but then make, uh, just continuing in our awareness, we want to be welcoming to, to lots of people who might feel on the outside for whatever reason. And I'm just wondering, you know, focusing in on relationship with people in generational poverty, you're also connecting to mental illness, you're connecting to disability, you're connecting to access in the community in lots of ways. So I guess what I'm getting at is, is, is this focus on a particular community of people that you've brought close to yourself. It, does, that, does that sort of inform your idea of inclusion as a congregation in, in, in broader ways? What do you think? <laughs> uh, I mean, you have something there you're trying to get at. Say, say what you see or have known. <laughs> well, just just what I said. Uh, radical acceptance. I think. I mean, it's. I think because faith has was blessed to be given relationship with a certain community of people, that's the community of people that, that is teaching faith to be welcoming. And so, so we, you know, we sort of learn as we go, rather than, you know, it's not like, oh, well, we can, we can, we can experience God's community with this, marginalized person, but this marginalized person, well, that's not quite, we're not quite there, you know? Yeah, I don't think every church has to be everything to all people. I think that'd be ideal, the kingdom of God. Um, but just like for our, our, our two hospitality houses, we have very specifically know what we can do and not do in order to sustain over the long run. And one of those things is um, people need to come with like a case manager or somebody who's helping them find housing on beyond uh, being at the Faith House or Hope House because we're not case managers um, and we don't, yeah. And so there's there's and so that makes it sustainable. We know what we provide. We provide hospitality and we provide housing for a period of time. But we need others to provide other kind of things. So I think it's sometimes it can get overwhelming when we think of we need to be all things to all people, even though that's ideal. But I mean, about a few years ago, I looked through our directory and there was a third of the congregation and maybe it was even more than that, who would have something that would fit the category of disability. Uh, a lot of mental illness, uh, learning disabilities, because uh, some of that goes along with poverty. Um, and, and so we're, we always have places we're stretching. And there's three persons, I mean, we have Hispanic folks with us. And, I mean, it's not just all white, but... I, I was interested in how you started because I wonder if Waterford as a congregation of 200 people or whatever, I mean, I remember a story that I think a lot of people here would remember. We were having a baptism down in our pond and as we walked out the door, there was this guy in work boots, tattoos, you know, standing there holding the door open for all of us. And he came down to the baptism pond and after the people were you know, the, I don't know, the five or whatever who were being baptized. He said he wanted to be baptized, you know. Um, anyway, so some in the congregation talked with him, and, 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 and then actually the next day he was baptized by a member of the congregation, and he came and he brought friends, and it was very exciting um, because it was a different, but after about a month or so, that kind of died out because, I don't know, they were... I think we welcomed them as best we could, but it didn't fit. And so, I mean, I just wonder, can a congregation like this welcome people in, or do we need to 
I don't know, start over. Because um, it, it just seems so hard to have... Uh, I remember some of our kids' um, school friends, too, came in and, and didn't even sit through the service because it was just too foreign. Um, I don't know. Um, is it possible for Waterford here, as we are, to have the kind of inclusion? I don't know. Do we have to give up the power of our, our comfortableness with each other? I don't know if I'm saying it well, but... I think we congregations are all called to different things and we don't all do the same thing in one community. If we think about ourselves as a church in northern Indiana, that is where hopefully we catch a lot of things. But not every in congregation ha um, has the same vision focus and has different gifts that they bring to a community. So I think it's pretty, if you think about it, there's quite a few congregations in Goshen that started out as community churches, you know, in different neighborhoods. And over time, that sort of, is, it's easy to, to, for that to be lost. So I'm always aware of that too, that the longer you're established, the more um, institutional it looks, the harder it is. Yeah. We're going to give up our Sunday morning and begin meeting Sunday night, and we just won't be able to see PBS Masterpiece Theater. <laughs> I guess. I mean, maybe it's not even that elaborate. It's it's a f assembly shares their space with us generously, and they have they have always let us be in that building without c charging us, which has allowed us to buy a faith house and a hope house and be making those mortgage payments. So some of it's just practical. It's when the church building's available. But though most of us really love it now and have a hard time switching out of that. Let me say from experience, once you've gone to church on Sunday evening and have to, for example, start going to church on Sunday morning, it's, it's yeah, it's hard. <laughs> you know, the... Just wanted to see if there's any questions on this side of the room here. The phone doesn't ring very often on Sunday mornings. <laughs> I've been sitting here thinking this, and I don't know for sure how I want to say it, but it, in answer to Linda's question and the way uh, Rod talked about that first endeavor to engage the committee and Africa, it was like, how do we get rid of this white supremacist approach to uh, you know, do we have to get rid of the mission idea? You know, we don't come with the answers. We have to come, I think, in humility and as learners, not as we can help fix you, you know, it feels like we have to give up our belief that we know the answer. I remember a pastor that I knew from long ago, a church in Texas or somewhere, and he said, oh, yeah, we're working with people in poverty, too. We have got these classes now where we teach financial management, and they're moving out of poverty. And I'm thinking, oh, we really are failing. Um, a very different approach. And I don't, but, you know, that sense, like, they, they had programs to help these people move right on out. And, uh, yeah, I think for, for faith, it's been much more walking with uh, just just a word about that. I would sooner trust relationship than program any day of the week at this point in my life. Amen. Um, programs can never deal with the specificity of an individual and the particular need or the particular issues that 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 person has. Um, and and so, yeah, I I don't know. I think you've you've got the <laughs> you've got the wiser approach, frankly. 
uh, and uh, you know when we don't treat people as cookie cutter, but when we actually accept them in all of their uniqueness, uh, I think there's something really powerful about that. And I want to say that it's we need folks who are out advocating in the community. Uh, I'm part of various home homeless kind of coalition things, but you know who are we need the window we need we need people going down to Indianapolis and advocating uh, so i'm I don't want to make it sound like well, we just stay insular in a congregation and those who come, but there's a place for anyone from any congregation ours included to be involved in bigger issues of addressing poverty and many isms. Any other questions? Final opportunity. Thank you so much, Kay and Rod, for sharing your experiences and opportunities to, uh, for us to learn and think. We appreciate that. So happy that you were here. Happy that you all were here. Maybe we take a moment to pray. We give you thanks, loving God, for the opportunities for relationship that you place in our way, um, for the ways that we learn um, to see your face um, in each other and in those around us, uh, make us um, open to share hospitality and friendship, um, make us uh, willing to uh, receive the friendship and care that is extended to us and to understand that this is an expression of uh, the love of Christ and the spirit of Christ within and among us. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.